The anime begins with Hajime Sugoroku giving us an introduction to Nama Prison, a supposedly impregnable prison floating in a remote part of the ocean, with state-of-the-art technology and elite guards recruited from around the world. Overall, it can be considered the number one prison in the world, as no one has ever managed to successfully escape from it. However, the introduction is cut short when the emergency alarm rings, because it turns out some prisoners from Building 13 are attempting to break out. They are Inmate 11, Inmate 25, Inmate 69 and Inmate 15 also known as Uno, Nico, Rock, and Jugo and have a knack for breaking out of every prison they've been locked up in. Hajime watches them closely from a surveillance room with Seiru Tanabata, a guard from Building 13. Meanwhile, the four inmates face various obstacles and traps as they try to escape. Uno uses a playing card to reveal a laser trap, which he, Rock, and Nico try to avoid, but Jugo had already disarmed the trap without informing them. This triggers another trap, causing the walls to close in on them. Thinking quickly on their feet, they manage to avoid being crushed to death by climbing up the closing walls and into an air vent, while Hajime looks on in frustration. Unfortunately for them, the air vent is being pumped with sleeping gas, so finding themselves in danger again, our group of unique convicts rapidly try to leave the vent while still conscious. <laughs> Later, they encounter Yamato Godai, the training freak deputy supervisor, in a maze trap. While Hajime is confident that the inmates will get lost and be captured, Yamato becomes lost himself, frustrating Hajime. The inmates manage to leave the maze and encounter a barrage of guards and guard dogs. Nico takes a shot for Jugo and seemingly dies in his arms, but he quickly reawakens because of his special body constitution and apparent drug immunity. As they reach the prison's exit, they face Hajime who easily defeats them. And they are dragged back to their cell. Sometime later, Jugo informs his friends about a girl he saw in the visiting room, which prompts them to escape once again. However, they soon discover that the girl is Hajime's cross-dressing younger brother. Meanwhile, Momoko Hayakushiki, the Namba prison warden, arrives at the prison and demands to speak with Hajime about cell 13 whom she describes as hardened and veteran escaped convicts. She warns strongly against Jugo, who plans to find the man with a scar on his neck, who put shackles on him in a former prison, believing that Nama prison is the last place he can look for this man. Momoko, the warden, had assigned Hajime to supervise Building 13 because she respects his ability and strength. She asks why the four inmates, Uno, Nico, Rock, and Jugo have not attempted to escape like in the other prisons, but Hajime maintains silence. She asks again if there were any issues while she was away, and Hajime lies, saying everything was fine. Salmon warns Hajime to tell the truth, threatening him with consequences if he lies. But an angered Hajime grabs Salmon by the neck and warns him to watch his words. Hajime promises to provide the files on the four inmates later, and Momoko dismisses him. Before leaving, he comments that the four inmates are not diabolical but merely a bunch of punks. Momoko calls Hajime back but thinks that Hajime is cool and is happy that he called her by her last name, as she secretly has a crush on him. Hajime conducts the roll call for the four inmates, and Jugo is missing. Hajime hears snoring from the night duty room and discovers Jugo sleeping there. Jugo explains that he couldn't sleep due to his cellmates snoring, grinding their teeth, and laughing, so he went to the quietest place he could find. Hajime suspects Yamato was responsible for letting Jugo in the room, but Yamato denies it, stating that he was working out. In the cafeteria, Rock enjoys his meal, and Shiro brings a cake for dessert. Later, Jugo asks about a Rubik's Cube, and Uno explains the goal of the game. Jugo solves it quickly, and Uno challenges him to solve a new puzzle. <laughs> Later Hajime returns to Momoko, and after a long trip and 50 security questions to verify his identity he gives Momoko the files on their infamous prisoners, as well as a quick introduction to each of them. As they briefly touch hands when handing the papers over, Momoko silently fangirls over Hajime and blushes at being touched by her crush. However, Salmon intervenes by giving Hajime a hit in the stomach, for supposedly being rude to the warden. <laughs> Nico was arrested on drug charges and he later escaped because he hated having injections and taking medicine but now enjoys the tasty medicine in Nama. Rock was arrested for starting a gang riot, and later escaped prison because he hated the food, but now loves the Japanese food in Nama. Uno was arrested for gambling in underground casinos and later escaped because he had a date with a woman, 
but he's being docile now because he has no dates. Jugo was arrested on theft charges, but easily escaped the next day. Out of the four he can be considered the most experienced veteran in escaping prisons, apparently he likes to break out because it's his hobby. But Hajime thinks that for the time being he has no desire to escape, although he is secretly the most suspicious of him since he doesn't know his motives and motivations. While the four inmates that have developed a strong friendship reminisce, an elvish man silently observes their cell and smiles creepily. Momoko is preparing for the arrival of a new infamous inmate to the prison with another record of escaping. While Seitaru Tanabata approaches Hajime Sugoroku, sobbing, and complains about being bullied continuously by the inmates of cell 13, Hajime suggests that Seitaru should resort to violence to make them obedient. However, when Seiteru is bullied again on his next shift, he flees, sobbing, and begs for help once more. Hajime scolds him and advises him on how to manipulate the inmates based on their personal weaknesses, saying that if the needs of the three main troublemakers are met, then the fourth inmate, Jugo, will also be obedient. In her office, Momoko informs Hajime of the new inmate who she wants to be placed in cell 13 to test whether the inmates will remain quiet under his influence given his record of captures and escapes. Hajime brings Tsukumo, the new inmate, and an apparent ninja, to the cell, and they plan a jailbreaking contest for the rest of the day, shunning Seiteru's offers of friendship. <laughs> However, Tsukumo's attempts to attack Hajime with his ninjutsu techniques fail, and he is ultimately trapped after spreading his makabish around himself. Tsukumo is then transferred to Cell 11, and the supervisors discuss the New Year's celebration tournament. The inmates in Cell 13 discuss the events of the previous year and decide to break out to mark the start of the new year. Meanwhile, Momoko abuses her power as the warden to sign up Cell 13 from Building 13 into the tournament, while the convicts in question prepare to do a New Year's jailbreak. Momoko makes the announcement that the traditional New Year's tournament at Namba Prison has begun. Meanwhile, the inmates look on in wonder at this beautiful warden. The four prisoners of Cell 13 are initially surprised but become keen and energetic to participate after learning that the winners of the tournament get an item of their choosing. Hajime is approached by Salmon in an attempt to taunt him as he believes that Hajime has already lost the competition due to the inmates he's participating with. This leads to an argument among the four supervisors, Kiji, Kenshiru, Salmon, and Hajime. While Rock, Nico, and Jugo observe the supervisors' colorful personalities, Mitsuru Hidako announces the rules of the tournament. The first event is a calligraphy competition, in which Jugo fails due to his inability to write. <coughs> Yamato and Hajime win the competition with their beautiful handwriting, securing the first win for Cell 13. The second event is a mix between Machai Pounding and Daruma Drop, where one guard and one inmate must finish beating their Machai without letting their Daruma be knocked over and their bowl fall on the ground. Rock and Yamato are chosen due to their strength and stamina. However, Liang, a former cellmate of Rock's from Building 5, participates as well, seeking revenge against Rock, after being previously defeated by him. He disarms Rock and mocks him for being greedy and cowardly. Rock becomes angry and fights back, ultimately knocking out Liang with a single punch. Yamato, seeing the result of the fight, becomes inspired and adopts a more aggressive approach and defeats Inori with one punch as well, <laughs> securing a victory for himself and Rock. Building 13 is declared the current leader of the tournament, and the next event is a game of Hayakunin Issue. Seiteru and Uno are nominated to represent Cell 13 in the game against Supervisor Kiji and inmates Twa and Honey. When the game begins Seitero surprisingly instantly wins each round, taking every card, leaving Supervisor Kiji dumbfounded at how quickly he lost the round. Meanwhile, Uno struggles and can't manage to win even one card while Honey taunts him. Twa then switches places with Honey and continues trying to taunt Uno thinking he can only cheat to win games. Uno surprises Twa by winning some cards despite being behind in the game. Honey tries to take his place but loses as well, and Uno reveals that he actually read Honey's body language to figure out which card he was going to pick. Honey accuses Uno of cheating, causing Twa to trade places with him to avoid any further conflict. However, Uno manages to take the cards from Twa as well by also reading his body language and noticing his habits. Meanwhile, Nico encounters someone who appears to be floating while retrieving his medicine. <coughs> he panics and runs back to the others, leaving his medicine behind. Uno continues to dominate the game, as he can now predict every move or action made by Twa, leading to Uno winning the game. Now back at the arena, the announcer Mitsuru announces the rules for the third event of the New Year's tournament, a Beyblade-style top spinning battle, except with super-sized spinning tops. The teams are introduced, Supervisor Salmon and inmates Yupa and Kai enter the arena for one team. Nico then recognizes Yupa as the person he saw floating. 
he tries to show the inmate to Hajime, pulling him into the arena. This leads the announcer to assume Hajime and Nico are the ones participating, leaving Hajime with no choice but to do so. The match begins with Salmon ordering Yupa and Kai to attack Hajime, but Nico prevents them from doing so. Yupa wants him and Kai to quickly defeat Nico, but Kai abandons the match as he's not the fighting type and would rather take a nap. Yupa then attacks Nico, and Nico begs him to teach him how to float. Yupa insists that Nico is too weak to be taught his kigong and attacks him again. Salmon and Hajime engage in battle while Momoko watches from the stands. Hajime tries to refuse to fight Salmon and goes after the spinning top instead. Yupa aims a powerful kigong attack at Hajime, looking suspiciously like the Kamihamiha, but this excites Nico even more. He begs Yupa to teach him and attacks, perfectly mimicking Liang's movements from his previous fight with Rock. Jugo, Rock, and Uno discuss how easily influenced Nico is, and Kai suggests that he makes Nico his disciple. <laughs> Yupa reveals that his request was going to be a disciple for him to teach. Nico reveals that he wants a video game console. Yupa mocks him and attacks him again, but agrees to consider becoming his master if he beats him. Salmon continues to fight Hajime, accusing him of lying to Momoko about his inmates. However, Hajime is unfazed and defeats Salmon by throwing the giant spinning top at him. <laughs> Yupa attacks Nico again, but Nico copies his technique and defeats him, winning the round for building 13. At the same time, the winner of the battle against Kiji and Kenshiro is decided with Kenshiro as the victor, which means that the last round will be building 13 against building 4. Mitsuru enters Momoko's office and playfully teases her before they both head back to the arena to discuss the progress of buildings 4 and 13 in the final round. Momoko predicts that their match will showcase the power of the guards to the inmates, which leads to more teasing from Mitsuru. In another part of the prison, Salmon and Inori discuss their losses against Building 13, with Inori mentioning the homemade medicine he received from Kai to heal quickly. Salmon reminds him that Kai's actions resulted in his imprisonment. Salmon also reveals that Kai used a numbing agent against Hajime and Nico in their match, but it didn't work on them. Meanwhile, Hajime complains about being tired in a separate part of the prison. Back in the arena, Mitsuru announces the final match between Buildings 4 and 13. Momoko explains the rules of the upcoming event, a sake barrel opening contest. Jugo's cellmates volunteer him to participate, while Kenshiru expresses his desire to fight Hajime. After some back and forth, the match begins, with Kenshiru fighting Hajime and Musashi targeting Jugo. Musashi proves to be too powerful for Jugo, while Hajime and Kenshiru battle it out using a variety of weapons. Musashi demands Jugo's shackles and initiates a spontaneous human combustion technique, revealing his control over fire. <laughs> Jugo, fueled by his desire for answers, transforms his arms into blades and attacks Musashi. <laughs> However, Mitsuru suggests switching the focus away from the tournament and towards what has been happening outside it. This suggestion annoys Nico, Uno, and Rock. Meanwhile, in the prison, Yamato takes Tsukumo to the visiting room to meet someone who has come to see him. Tsukumo is surprised but becomes antagonistic when he recognizes the visitor, Hattori Hanzu. Hattori persuades Tsukumo to stay and praises him for his dedication as an actor. Tsukumo asks Hattori how he found him, and Hattori reveals that he pretended Tsukumo had gone missing and now believes he will become more popular when he returns. Tsukumo refuses to return, and they begin to argue. Jugo overhears them while attempting another escape. Tsukumo reveals that he learned the truth and accuses Hattori and his co-workers of kidnapping and lying to him. Hattori doesn't reveal anything instead reprimanding Tsukumo for insulting his own mom, but Tsukumo admits that he knew she wasn't his real mother in the first place. In a flashback, a movie director looking for a real shinobi to star in her film discovers a young Tsukumo training with Makabishi. She convinces him to let her be his real mother and promises to make him a shinobi warrior. Years later, Tsukumo has become a famous child actor under the director's guidance, but he feels he doesn't know who he really is. He eventually runs away and ends up in prison. Jugo tells Tsukumo that his work is admirable and encourages him to be himself. During the New Year's tournament, Jugo attacks Musashi with his blades causing destruction in the stands and panic among the crowd. Mitsuru orders the inmates to evacuate and stops all camera and audio footage. Luno, Nico, and Rock survive the blast with Yamato's assistance. Jugo continues to attack Musashi, who retaliates with his flames. <laughs> Momoko orders Kenshiru and Hajime to capture the inmates for interrogation. Musashi attacks them with fire, creating a ring of fire to keep the guards away. Musashi and Jugo continue their battle, meanwhile, Kenshiru tries to separate them. Salmon and Kiji diminish Musashi's fire, and he is ultimately captured. 
Hajime faces Jugo, but Uno, Rock, and Nico intervene. Jugo turns on his friends and is ultimately beaten half to death by Hajime. Later, Hajime is berated by his fellow supervisors for his actions, but still, he secured a win for Building 13 at the end of the tournament. Mitsuru gives Hajime the letter which suspends him for three days, and Momoko regrets having to punish him. After his three-day suspension, Hajime returns to Nama and is informed by Seiteru that Cell 13 was calm during his absence. He meets Kenshiru on his way to see Jugo, who tells him that Musashi is being held in an underground cell in Building 4, and won't speak until he sees Jugo. Hajime is given a walkie-talkie to allow Jugo and Musashi to communicate. Hajime visits Jugo, who is conscious but in a depressed state and lacks the motivation to release himself from his chains. Hajime helps Jugo communicate with Musashi, who reveals that he is searching for the man with the scar and asks Jugo if he knows anything about him. Musashi reveals that he needs Jugo's shackles to kill the scarred guard. He explains that the scarred guard had augmented his powers, allowing him to fully control the flame, which made him feel like a monster. Musashi tried to attack the guard with his fire but was unsuccessful. Jugo is shocked to learn that there are two sets of his shackles. Hajime says that Jugo is empty as he has no desire or motivation for anything. Jugo admits that he didn't want or enjoy anything even as a child and only felt a sense of purpose when he received his shackles. He confesses to being envious of his cellmates for having wants and desires. Hajime offers Jugo the chance to choose his prize for winning the New Year's tournament, but he struggles to think of anything. Hajime throws him his cracked ID number plate, allowing him to return to cell 13. Jugo breaks his chains and takes the number plate, vowing to face his problems head on. At the beginning of Hajime's suspension, Kenshiru informs the inmates of Cell 13 that he will be taking over as supervisor. Momoko had previously instructed Kenshiru, Kiji, and Salmon to take turns supervising the building to minimize any risks during Hajime's suspension. Kenshiru takes Nico for a medical exam, but he becomes annoyed when Uno and Rock tag along. However, Kenshiru then reveals that Jugo is in the intensive medical ward in headquarters, and not actually in the infirmary. In the infirmary, Twa and Honey are receiving treatment for minor injuries from the tournament on Kiji's orders. Head Dr. Akina wants to examine Nico for any effects from the tournament before prescribing medication because he can mimic the moves of those around him, which can harm his body. Meanwhile, Uno and Rock search for Nico's medicine and eventually find Kagu-8 with it. The boys surround Kagu-8, and some behave in a highly inappropriate manner, much to Kenshiru's disgust. Hajime continues to work despite his suspension, and Hitoshi is concerned about him. On the second day, Kiji tries to distract the inmates from their sadness about Jugo's absence by teaching them about the prison's layout. However, an argument breaks out about who is the most handsome, and Seiteru fails to break it up. On the third day, Seiteru escorts Salmon to cell 13 to investigate Hajime's honesty. Salmon loses his temper when he finds the inmates still in bed, and Yamato charges in, causing the inmates to flee and hide. Salmon eventually finds them, and they reluctantly participate in Yamato's training with the help of Tsukumo. Meanwhile, Hajime volunteers at a construction site to avoid boredom. Eventually, Hajime brings Jugo back to cell 13 and explains that Musashi likely wants Jugo to fight the man with the scar. Hajime apologizes for his past actions, and Jugo forgives him. Momoko muses over how to greet Hajime when he returns, and Mitsuru teases her until she knocks him unconscious, causing Hajime to flee in intimidation. While sleeping, Rock has a nightmare about his past, and we get a flashback of the first time he was arrested. After getting in a fight with his father, he storms out and gets in a street fight, which he easily wins but gets arrested in the process. Despising the food at that prison he rebels, and supposedly escapes prison for the first time. He wakes up in a cold sweat, and Jugo questions if he's alright. But Rock tells Jugo he's fine as he'll receive his wish today, the stone oven he wanted all this time. Meanwhile, in Building 5 Liang's training is interrupted when the guard Inori comes and informs him that Rock requested his presence in Building 13. Although confused, he agrees to come and see what the fuss is all about. Now in the building's 13 canteen, Rock offers Liang the first slice of the first pizza ever made with the legendary stone oven. He refuses at first, but Jugo tells him to try it at least, which he then does and can't help but agree how good the pizza actually is. Shiro the chef then hands him some peach buns he made. As they all enjoy the delicious food, Rock says how he prefers food over fighting, since he only makes enemies when fighting, while eating always makes him feel satisfied and happy. Hearing this Liang apologizes to Rock for calling his dream ridiculous. Amused, Jugo comments on how much Rock calmed down since they first met. 
Rock can't help but agree, stating how a part of it is because of the delicious food he gets to eat every day. But the other reason is that he met Jugo. We now get another flashback to when Rock first met Jugo, after Rock was beaten and starved by the guards for not following orders. Jugo offers him some bread, seeing how Rock refuses to eat the plain bread. Jugo decided to break out and get Rock some burgers from a fast food joint. Back in the present, Rock thanks Jugo for helping him change and not be the indiscriminate loaded rifle he used to be. Jugo is slightly confused since he doesn't remember doing anything special, but he's then teased by Rock saying it's not something he'd remember. Uno then asks Shiro for some peach buns for Nico, and now we switch to him after his medical exam. While on the hospital bed, Nico can't help but feel lonely and depressed, especially after all the trauma he experienced in the past in similar rooms. Dr. Akina and his android helper Kaguya assure him that they'll soon be done and he'll be able to leave. Soon enough Uno, Jugo, and Rock visit him and bring along the snacks Shiro made for him. Akina tells the inmates not to get Nico too worked up since he still has to recover, making Uno remark that the doc is grumpier than usual. Rock even comments that having an unhappy wife means having an unhappy life, and Doc Okina actually agrees that his wife has been nastier than usual. But before he can finish his sentence, his wife head scientist Kazari demolishes a wall with a rocket launcher saying that she can show him what nasty really means. Soon enough the two start arguing. Uno intervenes telling Kaguya to say the line they practice together, Kaguya then does just that, and the two settle their argument, since they agree not to fight in front of their daughter. Kazari then informs Nico that his prize for winning the tournament, the game console is ready. They then move to a trial room where they can all try out the games available on the game console. Inmate Kai was then brought to the arcade room at Nico's request so they can play games together as master and pupil. Kai refuses at first but after being challenged he agrees to play at a claw machine, winning a plushie in the process. Kazari returns with Nico's super advanced and compact console that can play any game ever made. We then have a flashback to when Jugo and Nico first met after breaking out together and Jugo introduced him to Meng. Nico then thanks Jugo for relighting his will to live. Although slightly embarrassed, Jugo asks Nico to teach him to play video games, to which Nico instantly agrees. While playing, Uno spots Musashi with Kenshiru. He then calls out to the man grabbing everyone's attention, and insists he uses his common sense to apologize to Jugo. After Musashi apologizes sincerely, Uno invites him to the game room he won as his prize. Although happy to be invited, Musashi knows that he's not able to go. However, Kenshiru agrees to let Musashi go, on the condition that he reveals more about his past. Musashi agrees to reveal his past to Kenshiru, in exchange for spending time with the other inmates. Musashi recalls how when he was born, even as a baby, he had a higher body temperature than normal, which made him believe that he was special since his mother told him that he had the warmth of the sun. Unfortunately, it wasn't long since the heat became too much for child Musashi to handle, causing him tremendous pain as his whole body was burning alive. Every night he was also suffering from chronic nightmares of him literally lighting up in flames. One day while at school, his whole body flared up and he actually started to burn his entire body suffering from severe burns. The doctor who treated him revealed the phenomenon as spontaneous human combustion, noting how even his survival is a miracle. Soon he was bullied and excluded by his classmates because of his condition. Later he was to have caused arson in college, and when his house burned down and his parents were killed in the fire, Elf, that had disguised himself as a student blamed him, calling him an arsonist. While struggling against the officers wanting to arrest him, Musashi burst into flames once more, automatically taking the blame for the crime he didn't commit, which eventually led to his arrest and imprisonment. While in a prison in Germany, he ends up meeting the man with the neck scar who was the one responsible for transforming him into the monster he is now. The man offered to cure him of his condition, but instead, he deceived Musashi, amplifying his condition and giving him the ability to control flames, just so he could advance his research at the cost of Musashi's sanity and torture. When he confronted the scarred man and elf, he was told that he should be grateful for having given him so much power, and making him superior to all humanity. In a fit of rage for having been taken advantage of, he attacks the duo, but surprisingly the scarred man uses a sword arm just like Jugo and easily repels his attack. The man then says that after gathering all the data he needed he became useless to him, so he attacks, cutting his face and giving him the permanent scar he now has on his face. Musashi says that although the story is true he has no way of proving it since no evidence remains, so no one ever believed him. However, although agreeing that his story seems far-fetched and made up, 
Kenshiro believes Musashi after seeing his and Jugo's power as well as having heard of inmates being used for human experiments. We find out he was investigating these claims all along and while he was unable to convince anyone that the claims are true, he continued to submit reports. But his superiors kept rejecting his findings, so he realized that something shady was at play, but he promises to expose the culprits. Meanwhile, Uno invites the inmates from Building 3 to his game room but since he didn't finish furnishing it. He reveals that he actually wants everyone to contribute and make the room together since he wants to ensure that everyone will enjoy his game room. Hajime, Seitero, and Yamato arrive with the furniture Uno ordered and soon enough the rest of the inmates arrive as well and the rest of the items are brought. After Musashi appears as well, they start furnishing the room together and playing. Shortly later, Hajime tells them they only have one hour of free time, and it's now time to return to their cells, although they initially rebel, after a quick beating they obediently return to their cells. At night, Jugo can't sleep so Uno joins him and they discuss today's events, and Uno encourages Jugo to enjoy his life in jail despite his many flaws, which he ensures Jugo is aware of. Still, he ends by saying that they still have a lot to learn together, and they should take it slow and enjoy life one day at a time. Jugo then leaves the cell to take a breath of fresh air on the roof of Building 13. While admiring the night sky and reflecting on Uno's words on the roof of Building 13, Jugo meets the creepy elf. Nah. He taunts Jugo, telling him to make him laugh. Jugo is confused and scared by elf's appearance, not recognizing him. Jugo turns in anger, but Elf seemingly teleports up on a water tank. Amused, Elf says that they used to play all the time in the past. While Jugo tries to think about who Elf is and how he got here, Elf teleports in front of Jugo again and then seemingly stabs him. However, as Jugo steps back in panic, trying to put pressure on his wound and stop the bleeding, it turns out to be some kind of illusion and Jugo finds no injury. Elf keeps teleporting around, and he asks Jugo if he remembers the man that risked everything to free and protect him. Jugo is still confused and can't recall the events Elf is talking about, so he lashes out in anger telling Elf to stop beating around the bush and tell him who he's talking about. Elf continues his taunting not revealing who this supposed savior of Jugo is. Elf continues by stating that they gave Jugo some amazing things, but he has to actually use the weapons for them to gather more data. He then asks Jugo various questions about his sword shackles, referring to him as Specimen 15. Annoyed, Jugo curses at Elf, saying he refuses to hurt people with the weapons they forced onto him. Having revealed his connection with the Scarred Man, Jugo tells Elf to point him toward his sworn enemy, or Scram. Without saying anything, Elf dashes to Jugo and instantly pins him to the ground sticking a knife through his hand and telling him to shut his mouth and not insult his master. <laughs> While Elf goes off about how he should have killed him back then, Jugo has a flashback with a memory he had hidden deep in his mind, of the time when a man gave his life to help him break out and told him to find happiness and never be caught again. Elf states how he hates seeing Jugo happy, to the point where he's willing to kill everyone around him. Still, he says his mission is to retrieve his brain and doesn't need the rest of his body, but also doesn't want to bring his whole head with him. So with a marker, he draws a dotted line on Jugo's face horizontally, threatening to cut across the line and take his brain. As Jugo struggles desperately to escape, Elf takes out a bone saw and attempts to saw Jugo's head in half. Driven to breaking point Jugo unleashes his sword arm but this time manages to control his power and only uses one arm, shattering Elf's weapon and managing to break free from his restraints. As Jugo checks his wounds, it turns out all the harm Jugo received was an illusion again. Still, he can't believe what's happening, since he felt all of the injuries he received. Having gathered the data he needed Elf says it's time for him to go, but he tells Jugo to use his blades more often since they want to see what he's capable of. Jugo then asks what their plan with him and Musashi is, but Elf refutes, saying he doesn't know of any specimen going by Musashi. Still, before leaving Elf tells Jugo that he's also here to take another body, and he threatens to use Jugo's friends as lab rats and then proceeds to jump off the roof saying he'll visit Jugo again. After this encounter, Jugo can't help but be afraid for the friends he made and them suffering at the scarred man's hands. The next day Rock notices how Jugo is acting strange, not having said a single word, but Jugo assures them that he's alright. At night determined to avoid putting Uno, Nico, and Rock in danger Jugo decides to escape from Nama once and for all, as he stands up to leave, the trio wakes up too excited to break out for fun together again. Soon enough the prison alarm rings, and Namba goes into lockdown again. Having made it to the final door Jugo easily opens it and they meet Hajime waiting for them outside the gates. Jugo is determined to leave and not risk putting his friends in danger, so he steps out and touches a hidden button, locking Uno Nico and Rock inside while he faces Hajime alone. 
Shocked by his action, the trio questions him, but Jugo casually says his goodbye. Luckily, Hajime won't allow his escape and soon they start fighting seriously. Jugo releases his blade arms, while Hajime fights back just as fiercely, with neither backing down nor holding back. <laughs> Before the battle reaches a tragic conclusion, Seitaro arrives and unlocks the gate, after which Uno and Rock step between Hajime and Jugo and manage to stop them from fighting. They then restrain Jugo telling him they've made many promises together which they have to keep, and they return to their cell, as Jugo accepts that his home is in prison next to his unique friends as he promises to protect them and not run away. And once again, with the traditional introduction of the prison, somewhere across the ocean, at a location known only to the top officials of the country, lies a prison. Deemed impregnable, the prison is equipped with cutting-edge technology and guards recruited globally. With the overall impression of the number one prison in the world, no one has ever managed to escape it successfully. Though, it's not entirely the truth now, because an inmate who has the knack of escaping the prison has marginalized the security quite a few times, Jugo. The emergency alarm rings and Hajime, followed by Seiteru rush towards cell 13 for the most likely inmate to attempt an escape number 15, Jugo. Hajime finds Jugo acting asleep in his cell and smashes his head for the trouble. Later, Jugo's fellow inmates, Nico, Rock, and Uno laugh at him for his relentless efforts in getting caught and taking the beatings from Hajime. In her office, the warden Momoko ponders the way to stop Jugo from attempting to break the prison every now and then. Mitsuru troubles the warden when he impersonates Hajime and attempts to flirt with the warden, and she smashes Mitsuru on the floor in wrath. <laughs> Later, Hajime trembles to catch the warden, stained in Mitsuru's blood. <laughs> On the other hand, Seiteru is happy to buy a cozy-looking robot cleaner with his annual bonus, but Hajime smashes the robot in wrath as soon as it collides with his boot. In Building 5, Kai and Yupa argue over the cactus Yupa's family brought for her. Kai is a pharmaceutical chemist is all eyes for the cactus and begs Yupa to let him touch the cactus. In the game room, Honey makes a revelation that Tsukumo is the famous action character, Ninja Kamikaze. Jugo comes forward with his help because Tsukumo does not want the inmates to know that the country's famous character, whom they deem invincible is locked up in prison with them. In the guards' room, Kiji turns furious at Hajime, Salmon, and Yamato for not adhering to the regulations of the prison. <laughs> Later Hajime enters his office and notices a shadow with yellow glowing eyes behind him, but it turns out to be his pet, a cat that ranks higher than Seiteru at least. Salmon produces his weekly report to the warden. Kenshiru glares at Salmon from behind for his growing closeness with the warden, because Kenshiru sees the warden as his crush. Musashi makes fun of Kenshiru and persuades him to grow fond of the warden. In the hospital, Dr. Akina declares Jugo fit after the cat incident, while Honey and Twa flirt with Okina's beautiful assistant Kaguya. Suddenly, the entire prison turns up on their heads when they catch the hair color syndrome, which causes causes their hair to switch. From Jugo to Nico, from Warden to Seiteru everyone is baffled by their hair transformation. <laughs> Except for Hajime since he is the only bald person in the prison. The training of the new guards completes, as the warden spares them the necessary instructions for their duty. In Building 13, Hajime chases inmate 13. He can smell that Jugo is up to something. Hajime warns him to head back but once Jugo does not pay heed to the orders, Hajime smashes him in the cell. <laughs> Mitsuru approaches Hajime and makes a shocking revelation to him. A new guard is appointed in the cell with him. Mitsuru kept this as a surprise for him. The inmates are also excited about the new guard. To their surprise, the guard is Hajime's younger brother Hitoshi, who dresses up like a beautiful young lady. Hi! The inmates discuss their reservations about the Sagiruko brothers. On the other hand, Hajime is not pleased with his brother's new role either. Jugo enters the guard room with Yamato followed by the other inmates. Hitoshi is considerably shocked to see Jugo out of the cell effortlessly. However, the fellow guard Yamato looks quite overwhelmed by Hitoshi's arrival. 
the inmates maintain that they are here to confirm their doubts about the relationship between the wooden stone like Hajime and cute Hitoshi. The inmates Uno and Rock mock Hajime for his appearance and challenge him to catch them. As the tension rises, the inmates begin their run while Hitoshi chases them. <laughs> Seiru curiously inquires Nico not to run like her friends. On their run against Hajime, Uno is jealous of how someone ruthless and cord-hearted Hajime can have a kind considerate brother like Hitoshi. However, it's too hard for Hitoshi to chase down the fast Uno and Rock who don't seem anywhere near in his sight. Hajime on the other hand looks down on his brother Hitoshi and asks him to head back home as this job requires more strength and agility than a fragile Hitoshi can ever have. Uno locates the secret button that Jugo once unearthed. Hajime tries to stop him but Uno goes for the push out of curiosity. Surprisingly, what seemed like a fire sprinkler turns out to be liquid nitrogen, which has frozen Hajime entirely. Burning in wrath, Hajime breaks the layer of ice and begins the chase even more ferociously. <laughs> As things begin to intensify, Hajime throws his younger brother Hitoshi at the prisoner applying the fullest of his power, but the prisoners dodge it. On the flip side, while looking for his friends, Hajime Jugo ends up in Building 13 due to Yamato's poor navigation skills. In the surveillance room, Mitsuru has secretly passed instructions to an anonymous aide to handle Building 13. When Hajime hurries to him for the code red emergency in Building 13, Mitsuru acts unbothered and calls it a false alarm. In the turn of events, Mitsuru reveals that Hitoshi has been deployed in Building 4, not in Building 13. It was Hitoshi's request to spend his first day with brother Hajime. Hitoshi is glad about how his day went in Building 13. Hitoshi expresses that he has learned a lot and Hajime is lucky to have such people around. On the other hand, after the entire day's struggle, Jugo and Yamato somehow make it back to the guard's room, while Hitoshi assumes the duties in Building 4. On his visit to Building 3, Honey and Twa are all over Hitoshi mistaking him for a beautiful lady, but they soon flip on their head when Hitoshi reveals that's actually a dude. Later in the night, guards enjoy their party in person, unaware of the horror lurking beneath the facility. Rock challenges Supervisor Salmon to a fight. Salmon initially avoids the fight for his prior commitment with Yupa, but Yupa pulls out of the fight to leave space for Rock. Liang instigates Salmon as he mentions Hajime, and Salmon accepts the challenge. Rock is quite confident in his skills that he can easily take down Salmon. Looks like Liang has successfully created a fight to enjoy. In the first round, Salmon decides to only use his one finger to counter Rock who looks ready to pounce on him any moment, while inmate 99 is keeping a close eye on the developing fight. Rock goes all out at Salmon, swinging his fists to the fullest of his abilities but Salmon manages to dodge his every attack even with closed eyes. <laughs> Salmon still gets the better of Rock without even looking at him, as he makes Rock bite the dust merely using his one finger. <laughs> As round two begins, Rock unsheathes an array of ferocious swings of kicks and punches at Salmon but none of his attacks hit the target. At the end of the fight, Salmon advises Rock that he entails good reflexes but loses his senses in the rage and makes silly mistakes. Moreover, he only relies on his size, he should combine his mind and body in the fight. On the balcony, inmate 99 and Yamato appreciate Salmon's fighting skills. Yamato has also faced Salmon several times but even he could never beat Salmon. They wonder how Simon lost against Hajime and what made him hold back against Hajime. Inori informs Salmon about the meeting called by the warden. Meanwhile, Inori and the new guard Hizuki will watch the inmates. Warden explains that she has called the meeting to discuss the commissioner's urgent call for a meeting. The agenda of the meeting as well as the during is kept concealed from her. Kenshiru remarks that something must be building in the police department against the prisoner. On top of that warden is asked to bring confidential data of two prisoners number 15 and 634. Mitsuru probes who will be assuming her duties in her absence, and the warden expresses her confidence confidence in the supervisors to keep the prison in order during her absence. After the departure of the warden, the deputy supervisor Cat takes a dig at Salmon. She blames Salmon's Building 5 as the entire reason why the police department is after the prison. Moreover, the other prisons are still flagging the unfortunate incident that took place in Building 5. Cat does not stop here, she blames Salmon for using his connections to earn a spot as a supervisor, she calls him unworthy and nepotism.
nepotism took him here. In the past, Salmon's brother Inky murdered an inmate and injured his fellow guards. Cat thinks Salmon is indifferent to his brother, he is equally vulnerable. Salmon pushes her in anger and exits the room. Kiji slaps the big mouth deputy supervisor Cat for her unjustified resentment against Salmon. <coughs> Lost in thoughts of his rogue brother, Salmon is informed about a visitor, Noriko, Huzuki's elder sister. Noriki inquires about his well-being and expresses her desire to see Inki. Salmon replies that Inki is away for a while and he is the acting supervisor on his behalf. However, Noriki reveals that Huzuki is her younger brother who did a lot of effort to earn a place as a guard and she requests Salmon to take care of her brother in the prison. On the other hand, Huzuki offers tea and snacks to Yamato and Rock as a gesture of friendship and they happily accept the offer. In the guard room, Seiteru tells Hajime that something is wrong with inmate 15 as he has been acting a little off ever since his false attempt to escape. Meanwhile, Sujo comes across Rock in the building. Sujo inquires about the reason for his presence, but Rock appears different than usual. Rock coldly strides towards Sujo and punches him in wrath. On the other hand, Yamato is also causing havoc in the guard room. I don't think this has anything to do with the tea offered by Huzuki. Hajime successfully defends the punches and smashes Yamato back on the floor. What's up with this man's and smashing? In the building, Rock drags Jugo towards the cell and smashes him on the wall. Jugo tries to stand his ground with blood stained all over his body. Yamato gets back on his feet and smashes Seiteru who anxiously inquires about his well-being. In the cell, Jugo can sense something is not right with Rock. Jugo reminds Rock about their friendship and apologizes if he has unknowingly upset him, but Rock does not respond. Rock coldly stares at the cell and his friends inside. Jugo senses that Rock is now heading to hurt Uno and Nico in the cell and he places himself before his friends. Rock smashes him in the cell, Jugo can't stop the blood from spitting out of his mouth, but stays firmly between Rock and the others. Inside the cell, Uno shouts at Jugo to let him help, but Jugo refuses to let them out. Suddenly when everything seems to end for Jugo, Tsukumo comes to his rescue. Tsukumo was also in Building 5, and Tsukumo realized something was wrong with Rock and Yamato and followed them to Building 13. Jugo fears that the ongoing incidents between Rock and Yamato relate to him. It has something to do with his past when he attempted to escape the prison. They warn Jugo to come after him and his friends. With tears plundering in his eyes, Jugo trembles in fear that what he feared has become reality. Tsukumo calms Jugo, he does not know much about Jugo's past but he saw Jugo putting himself between the danger and his friends. Moreover, when Rock was hitting him, Jugo did not fight back because he did not want his friend to hurt him. For Tsukumo, Jugo is very loyal to his friends. Suddenly, Uno points at the ominous talisman attached to Rock's neck. When Tsukumo tries to take out the talisman, Rock swiftly responds and smacks him on the floor. <laughs> Rock strides towards Jugo to eliminate him but Tsukumo reacts timely and removes the talisman. And just when the talisman removes, Rock collapses. Tsukumo thinks he knows the talisman, and so does Hajime who removed it from Yamato's neck. In the hospital, Dr. Otoki advises Jugo to rest for a couple of days. Tsukumo is also present beside him. Meanwhile, both Yamato and Rock have been kept in the ICU. Tsukumo reveals that Building 5 developed the talismans to keep the Chi Masters like Yupa controlled. Besides, he was with Yamato and Rock the entire yet he failed to realize when the talisman passed on their necks to control them. When the Cell 13 inmates request to accompany Hajime on his investigation in Building 13, Hajime blatantly rejects their request. Uno persuades Hajime that they can be helpful in the investigation. Moreover, even if they do not take them, they will still find a way to Build 5 and Hajime will be punished for the outbreak. Hajime is short on resources, so he has no choice but to accept their offer. As they enter Building 5, Hajime finds himself caught in a trap set by Inori. <laughs> Building 13 inmates fall in the same cell where Liang and Yupa are incarcerated. Liang inquires about their purpose of visit. <laughs> Uno briefs that Rock had been acting strange due to a talisman chip to his neck. They came here to investigate the matter and unfortunately got themselves trapped in the cell. Yupa asks them to stay quiet, as the surveillance doll passes by. Uno, Jugo, and Nico have no idea what is happening in this building. Liang maintains that they have been caught in grave trouble. On the other hand, Hajime is locked in the cell opposite to Salmon. Hajime thinks Salmon is behind all this but he shockingly finds Salmon incarcerated in the opposite cell. 
Ruka and Inori stand before the ominous man and tell him about their progress. It turns out the man smirking in the shadows is Inki, Salmon's elder brother. In the cell, Lang briefs the inmates about the recent escape of Inki, the former supervisor of Building 5, who was their supervisor back in the Chinese prison. Inki is a cold-hearted supervisor to whom inmates are nothing but training dumbest. So basically related to my ex, got it. They were relieved to hear about his transfer to Namba but his brutality did not stop here either, as Inki was incarcerated on the charges of murdering an inmate. Liang and Yupa think that they are dead, these cells are built in such a way to stop their chi power, and Inki will kill them sooner or later. Shockingly, Jugo manages to unlock the prison which was deemed invincible to Yupa and Liang. <laughs> A while ago, Salmon is busy looking for the missing talisman when an injured guard reached him. The guard tells him about the escape of his brother Inki and Ruka. Salmon is sure that his brother cannot escape from the physically impossible cell without any external aid. Simon rebukes the guard for not informing him timely but the guard reveals that their communication system has been marginalized by the internal revolt. The guard stops Salmon from going after alone but Salmon heads to the spillway exit to settle his past resentments. Salmon comes across his brother Inky who punches him to the floor, Salmon gets up to fight back. Kyuja reminds him how he failed to counter his brother in the past and Hajime stepped up for the fight and won the supervisor rank for his courage. Things haven't changed much for Salmon who still hesitates to fight his elder brother. Inori also approaches the site and mocks Salmon for his poor comprehension of the matters going around. Inori deems Salmon unworthy of the rank of supervisor as Inori had been working with Inki since the start yet self-centered Salmon could not anticipate the coming dangers. They lock up Salmon and proceed with Inki's plan who aims to put up something behind the comprehension of Salmon. Presently, both supervisors mock each other caught up in opposite cells, Hajime blames Salmon for acting naive against Inki. <laughs> Hajime thinks Salmon is still afraid to oppose his brother and he merely acts to be against him. Strolling in the basement cells, Jugo comes across Hajime's name tag. They are certain Hajime must be around them. Uno rules out Liang's proposal of going out on their own. If they get caught, Inki will execute them and if they escape the building, they will still be deemed as the jailbreaker. It's a loss either way for them. He proposes to first locate the supervisors and use them as guards to exit this building. <laughs> They come across Honey and Twa who reveal that Kiji is also locked up in the building too. Liang sneaks past a surveillance doll and eliminates it with a single punch. Yupo elaborates that there is a manufacturing fault in the dolls, if hit in the head, they can be easily taken down. Hold up just taking some notes for when I'll see my ex again. Luno makes a plan to escape the five levels of the building, unaware of the fact that a doll is pulling him behind. Uno frightens to death once he turns towards the bunch of dolls. <laughs> They vehemently run for their lives as a horde of surveillance dolls chase them. Luckily, the inmates find the management room, the dolls are programmed to stay away from the management room, which makes it a perfect hiding place for them. Yupa describes the place as the forbidden archive room, once the office of Inki. Meanwhile, Nico's present health does not look encouraging, he needs to find his medicine soon but unfortunately, they don't find anything inside. Besides, looking for Nico's medicines, Jugo comes across the inmate's board and finds an ominous looking suit lying beneath. His unlocking ability comes to hand as he easily opens the suit but the documents inside the suit tremble Jugo on his head. There lies a study on Jugo, a product of human experimentation. Jugo realizes that the flashbacks he deemed as dreams are a reality from the past. On the other hand, Inori tells Inki that they have captured the inmate they have been looking for. In the past, during their previous encounter, Inki was confronted by a drastically transformed Jugo. With red flaring eyes and gleaming, elongated blades, Jugo appeared more like a being from another realm than a mere human figure in Inki's eyes. The revelation of certain documents has now flipped Jugo's world upside down. It becomes evident that Jugo himself is a stranger to his own body, and the prison administration possesses a deeper understanding of him than he does of himself. As they continue their journey in search of a hope of exit, Ruku interrupts them. He carries a creepy black talisman which is clear to indicate that he is playing in the hands of Inki. Ruku swiftly unsheathes his blades, launching a series of calculated swings toward Liang. Despite Liang's best efforts to evade the attacks, Ruku manages to land a few strikes. 
Coming to Liang's aid, Yupa intervenes, emphasizing that Liang should not concern himself with the considerations of his opponents during the fight. Instead, Yupa advises Liang to maintain an unwavering focus on countering and defending against the opponent's attacks. In the turn of events, Liang and Yupa decide to let others find an exit and stay behind to fight for their building. Liang asserts that others can slow them down and they all may end up dying if they stay together. Liang puts his entire faith in Jugo. He thinks Jugo is capable enough to set the supervisors free because he opened up the very strong handcuffs so effortlessly. With a heavy heart, Jugo, Uno, Honey, and Twa move forward with their journey uncertain of what terrors lie ahead for them. When Opa probes the reason for his faith in Jugo, Lang narrates the conversation he once had with Rock about Jugo. Rock describes how dedicated Jugo can be to his friends. Jugo, the one who granted Liang a profound understanding of true freedom when he released Liang from the handcuffs, now Liang is fully confident to utilize his fullest capacity and do what he failed to do earlier, that is to protect his master. They meet their old master Hachiman in the prison, Yupa and Liang, which brings Hachiman here. Hachiman utters that he is tasked to counter troublemakers like them. He cannot forget what they did to him and Hachiman wants them gone. Liang implies his utmost focus and breaks Ruku's sword in half. Twa appreciates Jugo's skill of opening the lock. He has never seen a skill like this in his life. Both Yupa and Liang also have resentments of the past and want to pay Hachiman for his atrocities. Uno and Jugo look everywhere but they don't find Nico around. It turns out that Nico decided to stay behind with Up and Liang and help them in their fight. <laughs> the ferocious pig gets back on its feet to fight back. Liang timely reacts and saves Yupa and Nico from the deadly attacks of Hachiman. In return, Hachiman implies his old trick and fires the toxic gas at Yupa and Liang. They can't comprehend how Hachiman has managed to acquire the gases in this prison. In the past, Hachiman offered a job to Kai in return for a lot of money. Kai has no choice but to accept Hachiman's offers and save himself. Later in the laboratory, Liang inquires about Kai's purpose in siding with Hachiman. Kai opines that he is merely a chemist who is creating the tools to stay alive. Even though Kai realizes that Liang does not belong here, he probes Yupa for the reason he took Liang here. Yupa explains that Liang was drafted by his master in order to spare the lives of hundreds of other students. Later, Kai rejects Hachiman's offer to make poisonous chemicals for him. Hachiman wants to make heaps of money by selling the life-threatening poisons, but Kai does not want to be a killer. Hachiman threatens Kai with severe consequences like Liang if he denies cooperating. Kai looks at Liang hanging in Hachiman's hands covered all over with blood. The sight petrifies Kai to death and he ends up accepting his offer. When both Yupa and Liang seems to fail against Hachiman, Nico jumps in to rescue them. Nico stops Hachiman's attacks and tries to counterattack him. Hachiman fires the poisonous syringes and the toxic gases at Nico but it does not impact Nico at all. For a second even Hachiman thought that Nico may be threatening him but his attacks reveal that he is harmless to Hachiman. Liang anticipates a detonating attack towards Nico and hurries in to save him. However, Liang cannot anticipate the next attack coming from Roku who is surprisingly using Chi's powers Liang ends up taking a huge blow to his body. <laughs> Though Roku is only exercising the chi magic because of the talisman and he uses the powers further he may end up taking his own life, but Hachiman does not care a bit about Roku, because he is prone to using others for his benefit. On the other hand, Yupa dodges Hachiman's attacks one after another but in the end fails to defend himself and sustains a serious beating at the hand of Hachiman. It seems as if Up and Liang are losing comprehensively against their former boss. Nico uses the least bit of energy left in him and fights for his friends but he soon begins to feel the need for medicines. The color begins to turn pale and his senses begin to dampen with every passing moment, and at last, Nico collapses. However, Nico has a dual personality disorder, and his collapse just raises the other personality residing in him. Uno and Jugo are worried about their friend Nico. They are well aware of his dual personality disorder and if Nico does not get his medicines, he is prone to hurt himself. Uno expresses that Nico is a product of human experimentation. His nervous control is not strong like a normal being, which means he is bound to hurt himself and others when his other personality takes over. In the fight, Nico now attacks Hashiman like never before. Hashiman asks for Ruku's help but surprisingly, Nico can control and redirect the Chi Gong's powers as he redirects the Chi back to Hachiman. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hachiman needs help to fight the uncontrollable Nico. Hachiman looks for help but Yupa and Liang set Luka free from the talisman. Nico jumps at Hachiman but he manages to stop him and smashes him into the wall. Hachiman thinks he has taken the better of Nico. On the other hand, the miseries, resentments, and atrocities of the past burn the transformed Nico in vengeance as he rises unsheathes an even ferocious tally of attacks at Hachiman. <laughs> Hachiman realizes that Nico is too strong for him to handle. He is not able to anticipate Nico at this pace. Sensing the right time to take his revenge, Kai also enters the fight. Kai reminds Hachiman about the poisons he forced Kai to manufacture for him and the present situation of Nico is a true demonstration of his deadly products. Kai has seen Nico's depleting state and he takes care to bring Nico back in senses. Nico smells his medicines and bites Kai in desperation. Kai injects Nico with the medicine and Nico collapses with the dose. Hachiman takes a relieving breath. He can now shift his entire focus back to his disciples. However, Hachiman fails to anticipate Kai's intentions as Kai injects Hachiman with the poison. Kai asserts that Hachiman has always been a cold-hearted person who can go beyond the limits to drain others to capacity for his benefit. Hachiman failed to realize his true intentions and this allowed Kai to take his revenge on Hachiman. Back in the laboratory, Kai's supervisor extracts Yupa's kidney for his further experimentation. The supervisor maintains that Yupa is a legendary Chegong warrior, and his body parts can be sold for good money by Hachiman. Since that day, Kai desired to take revenge on Hachiman for using others. In the present fight, both Liang and Yupa put a collective effort. They jump in the air one after the other and eventually manage to land substantial blows to Hachiman. However, Yupa is not pleased with Kai. He had been working for Inki yet he did not bother telling them. Kai replies that this could have landed Yupa and Liang in considerable trouble to he kept it concealed. However, Yupa does not look confident of Kai's explanations and rebukes Kai for his selfishness. Though in their past life, it was Kai who helped Yupa with his dialysis treatment, when all hopes for Yupa's survival were diminishing. Meanwhile, Hachiman gets back on his feet, ready to pounce on them any moment. Three of them have their resentments against Hachiman. Hachiman appears so busy fighting Yupa and Liang that he fails to intercept Kai's trap for him. Hajime strives to continue the fight but the dose of poison is stronger for him to handle. Hachiman begins feeling suffocation and loses consciousness, eventually Hachiman surrenders to the medicine and collapses. <laughs> Amidst their win over Hachiman, Yupa does not look convinced. He opines that the talisman Yupa removed from Ruko's face was not familiar. Yupa looks confident that this talisman does not belong to Inki. He wants to probe for answers real quick but Ruko is not in his senses at all. <laughs> Although Liang and Yupa have closed the only entrance on the way up, Kai decides to take them through the hidden passage he knows. Nico looks extremely fretted about the dangers lying ahead for them. His master Yupa encourages Nico to proceed with the journey with heads held high. Yupa and Liang decide to save Building 5 till Salmon returns. Salmon is the one who cared for Yupa back in the days when Yupa was brought to Nanbaka after their organization collapsed. Salmon informed Yupa's family about his existence and helped them contact Yupa. Salmon is unlike the ordinary supervisors to Yupa. He has Yupa's respect and now Yupa thinks it's his turn to stand for Salmon. In the hospital, Tsukomo now looks well recovered. Wondering what happened to Rock and Yamato, he hopes they are fine. Tsukomo recalls the incidents from the particular day and ponders if the new guard of Building 5 Uzuki has anything to do with their condition, but he does not find any trace of supporting incidents to blame him. On the other side of the curtain, Dr. Otoki stands before the unconscious Noriko. Otoki does not normally treat civilians but he is looking after Noriko because of the urgency. Moreover, to his relief, the deputy supervisor's cat is alone too. On the second level of the basement, Uno decides not to hold back and go after Nico. The others stop him from making such a childish mistake. They opine Nico must be safe with Liang and Yupa but Uno does not pay heed to their assumptions. A sudden, water stream running towards them petrifies them all but it's too quick for them to react. <laughs> Eventually, Jugo being the weakest of them all, drowns in the water. Jugo! Honey hesitantly provides him immediate CPR and saves Jugo. Meanwhile, Twa discovers a hidden room and Jugo opens the entrance for him. It's the warehouse of surveillance tools. Uno trembles in fear while Twa looks very curious about the build and design of the dolls. Honey wonders why they have not been caught or chased till now, and suddenly Rukagaju appears before them. <laughs> 
Agonized by their jokes about his appearance, Rukagaju orders his two subordinates to chase them down, and they begin running for their lives across the building but the chasing guards are empowered with Chegom, which helps them sprint super fast in the chase. In the cell, Kiji shouts at Rukagaju to let him out, Rukagaju mocks Kiji and when Kiji inquires about the screams, Rukagaju smirks at Kiji and responds that dreadful screams are of his inmates running for their lives. Kiji lures Ruka for the makeup kit if he lets him out, Rukagaju seems to fall prey to his offer as well, as he wants Kiji's products to enhance his looks. On the other side, Twa surprises the inmates as he blows away the guards with one shot of his rocket launcher which he just built with a scrap of dolls. The inmates dust themselves up and begin their journey for the three level but their search is interrupted when Rukagaju appears out of nowhere and grabs Jugo, who is their key to the exit. Honey smashes Ruka in the head and they run off. Twa shouts get to the next floor. Once they leave the guards behind, Honey turns towards Jugo. Honey proposes that Jugo is the weak link in their team and they must not take him further. Twa intervenes saying that Jugo is the sole reason for their escape. But he fails to convince Honey who is already fuming in rage. Honey looks down on Jugo. For him, Jugo is the most useless inmate around. Honey opines Jugo is selfish most of the time and his face speaks as if Jugo is planning on something. Uno intervenes and rebukes Honey for looking down on Jugo. Jugo inquires Uno if he thinks the same about him. Uno clarifies that they have been long enough to trust each other and he has full faith in Jugo. Uno understands that Jugo comes with one hell of a past, and his behavior is understandable. However, sometimes Jugo's expressions make him wonders if he knows Jugo. Uno hopes that one day, Jugo will put up the courage and tell him about the incident on the game night. Uno opines that Jugo is unnecessarily carrying the burden of an incident that is weighing him down. Jugo decides to open his lips about the incident on the game night but just before he says anything, they hear a blast, the guards are coming at them again. Ruka orders his guards to first eliminate Jugo, and his guard opens an array of punches on Jugo's face. Uno strives to defend his friend but he is nothing compared to Rukagaju and his men. Honey begins to leave the site, he believes Jugo and Uno are weak and they have caught themselves in trouble because of their vulnerability. Twa convinces Honey to step up and help them in their time of need. Ruka is angry but Uno's relentless interruptions to save Jugo and decides to eliminate him with his dagger. Ruka points the dagger at Uno but Honey breaks his dagger into pieces. Shocked Ruka looks at Honey in disbelief. Other, Honey's attack begins to prove lethal for Ruka and his men. His unique invisible wire bind with the cartridge beats out Ruka. Twa assess the tiles and assert that they are walking on the tiles mounted on the water pond. This is why Ruka is appearing out of the tiles because he is using the water beneath the tiles. Both Honey and Twa plan to take down Ruka. Honey has secretly tied up Ruka with his wires, and upon realizing Ruka cuts down some of the wires but it turns out he could only cut the decoy. The actual set of wires tied around his body was out totally out of his sight. Both friends open a tally of attacks at Ruka and his guards, leaving them dumbfounded. <laughs> One after the other, Honey and Twa seem to dominate Ruka and eventually strangle Ruka in a cage of tiles created by Honey's pull of tiles. Twa rain a heap of bombs at Ruka aimed to burn the heck out of them but unfortunately, their attacks still prove insufficient as Ruka rises from the water, looking more menacing than ever. The building jolts with their intensified battle and even Kiji senses a shock in his cell. Burning in vengeance, Ruka opens attacks unlike before. His strong wind attacks rattle the surface below their feet. Ruka wants to end this fight with their corpses. <laughs> Honey shelters his companions against Ruka but he cannot hold for long. Twa says that their skill set is not compatible and they can't stand Ruka's attacks, therefore Uno must escape with Jugo. Honey and Twa may be able to save themselves here but can't fight Ruka Gaju while protecting Jugo and Uno. Just when Jugo and Uno hesitantly begin striding back, Ruka doubles the intensity of his attack and breaks Honey's defenses. Honey and Twa put up the fight with the little energy they have, though Jugo and Uno have escaped the scene. Jugo is still dozed off, he does not want to leave behind others. With no plans to escape and running short on options, it seems both Honey and Twa are caught at a dead end. To their surprise, Jugo comes to their rescue. <laughs> The sight before Ruka's eyes is surprising yet terrifying for Rukagaju. Jugo's appearance is entirely shocking for all of them. The red flaring aura and the stealth blades remind the description of the monster Inki once faced. Ruka thinks it's his chance to prove himself before Inki and take down the monster he always talks about. 
Rukagaju fires his wind strikes at Jugo. Shocking Jugo maneuvers his winds and shoots them back at Rukagaju. Eventually, Jugo drives off Rukagaju for the first time. Jugo can see a spark of acknowledgement for his powers and abilities in the eyes of his fellow inmates. However, Ruka, gutted by the beatings, is persistent not to lose against Jugo. Rukagaju fights back with even more ferocious attacks but he trembles in fear when Jugo assumes his wind power, amplifies it, and then directs it back to Rukagaju with even more brute force. On the other hand, Inki senses movement in the basement and asks Inori about the control of the basement. Inori explains that Ruka is in the basement and he is capable enough to take matters under his control. However, Inki fears if the movement refers to the monster he thinks, Ruka won't be able to stand a chance against the monster. The guards once under the control of talismans are now accessible, but surprisingly, they turn against the inmates. Uno tries to explain the events but they don't seem to believe in his outlandish story. With no option left, Honey and Twa engage the guards meanwhile Uno and Jugo continue their search for Salmon. Jugo begins to open up the locks while Ruka reattacks and tangles Uno in the chains. Uno sacrifices himself for Jugo, and Ruka drags Uno and he shouts at Jugo to continue his search till he finds Salmon. Guards are shocked to see their former inmate Jugo standing before them. It is now when they begin to believe in Uno's story but Ruka threatens them with the consequences, and the fretted guards join Ruka. Twa and Honey rescue Uno. Twa is confident that Kiji is incarcerated somewhere near because he can smell Kiji's perfume at this very level. One after the other, Jugo shreds the doll into pieces as he continues combing for Hajime and Salmon. On the flip side, Senki can sense the demon is heading towards him, inching closer every moment. Mitsuro realizes that he has been fooled by Ruka, and the surveillance system of Building 5 has been compromised. Kenshiro stops Mitsuru from informing the authorities. He believes Inki must have some reasons for his outbreak and they must wait. On the flip side, guards follow the three inmates Uno, Honey, and Twa. Shocking, Twa executes Uno's plan. He jumps in the water to challenge Ruka in his domain. Ruka falls for their plan and ends up losing the keys of Kiji's cell. The entire room is stained with blood as Sujo continues to comb building after building and keeps slicing every menacing doll coming his way. Enki is now certain about Sujo's presence and follows his instinct in Sujo's hunt. Kiji hears footsteps approaching his cell, he looks outside and surprisingly finds his inmates being chased by the guards, who jump in the way to stop the inmates from reaching Kiji. However, Honey implies his trick and helps Kiji escape. The guards shiver in fear as they find Supervisor Kiji glaring at them. Kiji spares the inmates for the mess they have caused and also drives off the guards too. Ruka appears out of the water to fight Kiji, who easily manages to handle Ruka. Kiji advise him to judge what is right for him and what is not. Ruka bursts into tears and falls on his knees before Kiji. Kiji fears the outcomes if Jugo's power the level beyond their comprehension, as the report says its outcomes can surely be threatening for the prison. The inmates are delighted to see each other unharmed. Kiji has a bigger challenge lying ahead for him. Hundreds of dolls have flooded the exit, and he has to fight them to make his way to reach Hajime and Salmon down on the fifth level. Jugo comes to Hajime's rescue and helps Hajime get out of the bars so effortlessly. Jugo asserts that he is ready to embrace his power and start a new chapter of his life in Nanbaka. Hajime wants to leave his rival Salmon in the cell but Jugo insists to help him too. Salmon trembles on his head when he comes to know that Jugo can escape any cell or handcuffs in seconds. Salmon lashes on to Jugo to detain him but Hajime abstains him from doing any harm to his inmate. Tension is engulfing Building 5, where Hajime, Salmon, and Jugo are coming after Enki, who looks well prepared for the challenge ahead of him. Mitsuru is keeping a close eye on the developments and Kenshiru appears well suspicious too. And with that, both seasons have ended. Let us know what your thoughts are. Huh? <laughs> 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 <laughs>